The wounded owl had seen its share of scuffles. Typically, the patrons offered a disinterested glance to the parties involved and took their drinks to the other side of the room. Today, the hush that fell over the tavern was impressive, meaning I was in real trouble. Heavy footsteps came at me from the rear. Getting rid of one problem, I snapped the blacksmith's neck and shoved to my feet. I stepped away from the body then, and a long, wide shadow stretched over mine. It shifted, circling me. An anxious, wet breath breathed out of the man it belonged to. The intrar. His heavy, distinctive accent startled me. As he came to a stop, I looked up past his substantial girth to his scraggly, bearded face. The nostrils of his bulbous nose flared at my inspection. His deep, set gaze narrowed, but I kept going all the way up to his head of long, unkept hair. Wild, wavy, and matted, the thick shoulder-length strands were just as I suspected. They weren't brown or black or even something in between. They were profoundly dark, like a bottomless pit or a faded cell when the lights would turn out. And they were dark like the color of death himself. During the war, we called it Langorian Black, and I had seen the shade up so close, so often that there was no mistaking it, but I hadn't seen it for a long while. After I used the crown of stones to slaughter an entire army of the black-haired fiends, the whole of the realm shut itself off. It was rare when one even crossed the border, and none had been spotted this side of the Kalish Mountains in years. Behind him was an armed mob of about twenty Kalishmen. A few were big and rough-looking. The rest were your basic, desperate city dwellers out to earn a fat purse. Some were taking their job seriously, positioning themselves at the door and the stairs. Six of them were really ambitious. They ripped hostages out of the crowd, leaving the remnant's customers and tavern workers to huddle together in a corner, whimpering and praying for their lives. Emas wasn't among them. As I turned to look for her, a bottle hit me in the side of the head and exploded. I spun around and met another one in the chest. A third hit my right shoulder. Son of a bitch! I pulled the sword off my back. Blood and wine streaked down out of my hair. More streamed off my forehead and slid down the back of my collar. By the time I wiped it from my eyes, one of the hostages was dead on the floor. Toss it! The Lingorian ordered. Both of them! Or, pausing, he made a show of adjusting his grip on the axe in his hand. Its long, sharp head was substantially bigger than the one on his shoulders. You can watch them all die. I gave up both my weapons and slid them across the floor. The Lingorian shifted the axe to his other shoulder. And the question, worm, are you Ian Troy? Dabbing at the cut on my head, I snarled at him. You know exactly who I am. I want you to say it. Say what you are. Murderer. Butcher. Slayer of kings. His meaty cheeks puffed with a smile. War criminal. I froze. Did you just say? He nodded, and everything in me constricted. You can't be serious. Your crimes against my kind are well-known, Shinri. My crimes? Your fucking kinsmen were a plague on the land for years. They were a disease, an infestation that deserved to be wiped out. Temper overriding caution, my voice spiked. The torture, the rape, the beheadings. Entire villages burned to the ground. Children gutted. I should have ripped their goddamn insides out one piece at a time. Careful, you might give me ideas. His fleshy lip curled upward. My name is Danyan. Remember it when you beg for your life. Astonishment added to my anger and I laughed. God. You fucking Lingorians are all the same, with your balls bigger than your brains. Tell me, Danyan, how did you manage to make so many friends? I nodded at his henchman. You've got about as much personality as the mud on the bottom of my boots. And let's face it, there's no love between the Lingorian and the Kalish. There's more love between the Kalish and their coin, and it didn't make much to sway them to the truth. Which is that you're evil and they are trespassers. Trespassers. Are my words not playing which? Kale's claim to this region is unjust. A thousand years ago, all of this! He opened his plump arms wide. Kale! Rayla! Everything from sea to sea! All the restless lands belong to us! Guess you should have done a better job claiming it then, asshole, because Miraclan is an ancient Shinri word, not Lingorian. Besides, don't you think a thousand years is a little long to hold a grudge? We were a peaceful people, simple farmers and hunters. The Shinri were the disease, emerging like insects from their mines below the ground, spreading from shore to shore, overrunning us! Conquering us, forcing us into the mines, enslaving us with magic. Danyan's ample jowls tightened. We live like animals. We lost our history, our identity. He looked at me long and hard. Air rattled in his throat as his breath picked up speed. Do you dare deny that? You know I can't. But that way of life, what my ancestors did to create and sustain their empire, they paid for it. Yes, 
the gods saw the wickedness of your kind. They saw our persecution. They reached down, grabbed the land of the Shinri, and shook it. They opened the mountains and pulled your entire domain down into the ground where it belonged. You fell, and we rose, he exclaimed, thumping a hand to his chest. We survived. We grew strong while the Shinri, without their precious rucks, became weak, slobbering fools. They became the slaves. He shifted his axe again. Kale has not yet paid. Rayla has not yet paid. And what exactly do you owe? Do they owe you? The ground they live on. We want it back. The depths of his stupidity made me smile. You're a fool, Danon. The centuries of fighting between Rayla and Langor, the war, was never brought land. The original treaty that was signed, signed and then broken by Draken's father. King Thraven had nothing to do with territory. It was broken over a woman. King Taven made a legitimate offer of marriage to that Raylan wench. What happened when she turned it down was her doing. That Raylan princess, I said, emphasizing her title, was already betrothed. Your king should have respected that. Instead, he sent men into Rayla to drag her to Langor. Then he wasn't even man enough to marry her. He threw her into his dungeons and let her starve to death. Brazenly, I stepped forward. The only property that Rayla and Langor fought over for 25 years was the battered body of a dead princess. He sniffed. You know nothing, Shinri. I know he didn't slay your damn king. Either of them. Some other fortunate soul ran Taven through long before I saw my first battle. And his son, Draken? He was certainly worthy of a plainful end. But we both know I didn't give him one. No, you did far worse. King Draken was a good man before your magic fouled him. He was noble! Decent! Draken? Decent? I rushed closer. Nose to nose, I snarled at him. What decent man orders a child stolen from a bed? Elana Arcana was old enough to be Draken's queen. If she had survived, but she didn't, did she? Draken only fancied a relent bride because he wanted to succeed where his father failed. But ordering that poor girl brought across the Langorian mountains in the middle of winter? Your noble king might as well have murdered Eligar's daughter with his bare hands. She had another. The bitch should have been grateful we didn't take the boat. Rage sped through me as I remembered all too well the day Eligar learned of her eldest daughter's death. It was the only time I'd ever seen her cry. How the hell are you even alive, I asked her. You weren't on the battlefield that day, or you'd be dead. Were you a deserter, is that it? Where have you been for the last ten years, Danyan? Sitting around some stinking Lingorian drink house, working up your courage and saving your coin so you could recruit enough village idiots to come against me? She will regret that. I regret a lot of things. Another man's voice filtered down from upstairs. That's good to know! I'd be displeased to learn that you live without shame. Alarms went off in my head. I turned to look. But I didn't need to. Like Danyan, I knew the accents coming out of the man. It wasn't Langorian, though. It was measured and exotic. It was Elagar's. You're a long way from home, Arulin, I said, watching him descend the stairs. Eight months by ship, he confirmed. But you are worth it. I'm flattered. His boots hit the floor and he paused. Don't be. Crossing the tavern, the Arulian halted in front of me, and I was suddenly all out of glib comments. Because the man didn't just share a homeland with Elagar. He shared her blood. There was no mistaking it. Except within a masculine face that was all angles and lines were her crescent eyes and expressive mouth. On a taller, wider frame was her perfect symmetry of elegance and lean muscle. He had Elagar's skin, too. Dark as midnight and flawless. His hair was the same jet black strands that hung twisted and gnarled all the way to the small of his back. I cleared the shock from my throat. You're a warrior in the Aurelian Guard, I said, gesturing at his breeches and sleeveless shirt. They bore no markings of rank, but the subtle material was crafted with an intricate symbolic stitching I recognized. Your countrymen aided Rayla in the fight against Langor. They were brave beyond words. It is our nature. Your nature, however, smiling slightly, the Aurelian's somber brown eyes searched mine. My people say there is little that separates bravery from insanity. Even less lies between penance and acceptance. His smile thinned. I believe you, Shinri. Live somewhere in between. It's been a long day, Arulin. Why don't you just stick with who you are and what you want? My name is Larith. He bowed slightly. What I want is your head. I blew, a breath, uh, I blew out a breath. What was that all? Beside him, Danyan laughed. Polite Arulin. Why ask when you can take? Larith didn't even look at him. Your opinions mean low less to me than his, Langorian. I suggest you don't offer it again. As Danyan slucked away, I nodded after him. You two make an unusual couple. Not for much longer, Lareth smiled again. The expression came nowhere near reaching his eyes, and I didn't trust it one bit. 
I have no wish to hurt you, Shinri. Submit yourself for execution and you will feel no pain. You do this now, after ten years. Grief is patient. It waits for justice, while governments change and canes fall. I fought alongside your people, Lareth. I watched them die defending a realm that wasn't even theirs. I bled with them, befriended them, killed them. His perfect jaw twitched. Eligar was my cousin. She was my commander. She was my commander. I felt her loss, too. She was a princess of Arula, a daughter of my king's house, and I honored her for that. You defiled her! Murdered her! I did, yes, he broke in. You did. Nodding, I ran a shaky hand over my face. I never meant to hurt her. I never meant to hurt any of your kind. Perhaps not. But the mind cannot always know what the soul intends. He went still a moment. I sense honor in you, Shenry. You would prefer no one see it. You want us all to revile you, to hate you, as that gives you leave to hate yourself. But I am not here out of loathing. I feel no more animosity toward you than I would a starving wolf caught consuming my flock for sustenance. You are what you are, just as the wolf is. But when the beast can no longer be trusted to curb his hunger, when he crosses the line, he must be destroyed. I held his gaze. If it would bring her back, I would give you what you ask without a question, I swear it. Oh, I believe you. But I could tell by the look in his eyes that wasn't enough. Daniel moved forward. He bellowed at his mob. Rip the witch to pieces! An extra bag of coin goes to the one that gets the rock off his head. The rock off his neck. The Kaylees tossed their hostages to the floor and formed a line in front of me, shouting obscenities and brandishing weapons as they worked themselves into a frenzy. I pulled the two small throwing knives in and the braces that covered my forearms. Then I beckoned to the obsidian. I didn't think I didn't agonize over how I was willing. I didn't think. I didn't agonize over how I was willingly channeling magic again or risking lives. After all, the wounded owl was a den for outlaws and thieves. If King Ryan Arcana was truly dead, and the Crown of Stones was compromised, there was a lot more at risk than a few delinquent tavern dwellers. I have to protect Rayla. I can't die here. I opened myself up to the stone's aura. I swallowed everything it had, and a wave of heat layered my skin. A stream of piercing cold pumped through my veins. Vibrations stroked my nerves. Choosing a spell that wouldn't sap me too much, I uttered the words and hurled the power out. Born out of necessity, urgency, and desperation, Casting battle spells was a naturally swift process, more so than any other kind of Shenri magic. Even so, it had been a long time since I'd used one in a fight, and as Euphoria masked the remaining pain of my injuries, the stone's aura blinded me, and my energy level dipped all blindingly fast. A sudden barrage of overlapping sensations left me teetering. A breath later, the spell sought out the strength that needed to be born, and a body or two went down. As my vision cleared, I didn't live to see who it was that fell, or exactly how many. I'd cast on myself to keep the price to others low, and looking wouldn't keep them from dying anyway. What's the matter, boys? I said, watching the gang of men waver at the sight of me. The fear on their faces was plain. Is this a little more than you signed up for? You won't cast here, Dan said with confidence. What the Rauriel and said is true. You consider yourself an honorable witch. Maybe. But right now I'm an angry one. Angry enough to call these people to save yourself? You involved them, not me. Tell you what, though, Danyan. You clear out the place out, and I'll pull the spell. In, I'll put the spell away. You and I can go blade to blade. It's what you really want anyway. Just let everyone go. We. The words jammed in my throat. My breath did too. I couldn't move. Couldn't understand what was happening as all, as all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a fresh wave of magic was rushing into me, caressing my nerves blindingly fast and hot enough to make me flinch. At first, I thought my friend from the swamps was at it again, but the feel was definitely obsidian in nature. The shot around my neck was a dry, vacant husk. I'd already taken everything it had, and there was a slight variation in the stream that the power wasn't originating in the shard. It was flowing through it. The spell, quick, the spell quickened. The vibrations magnified. They turned fierce and forceful, the pressure in my veins, one current riding atop the other, brought with such sweet agony. More assaulted me, a stampede of blended auras piling in, accelerating, intensifying, I was a barely contained explosion. The sensations, the power, were almost too much to comprehend. It was a kind of terrifying splendor that I had encountered only once before in my life, an experience in pleasure I would never forget. No, I gasped. It can't be. It's hundreds of miles away. This isn't possible. How is it in me? But how didn't really matter. The power of the crown of stones was surging through my body, and there was no way it was a coincidence. Being Shindri, I didn't believe in such things. I put no faith in luck either, good or bad. Fate has his dirty little hands in everything, 
So there had to be a reason that the first time I willingly channeled the shard, I put the crown to, I got the crown too. Unfortunately, there was one way that made sense. Somehow, the crown and the shard were connected. If that were true, then when King Rayan chipped the slender piece of obsidian off the crown of stones, he broke the piece from the whole physical, but not magically. Whatever held the crown together, whatever formed the artifact in the first place, was a link too strong to be broken by crude tools, or apparently separated by kingdoms. All this time, all these years, I'd sworn the shard every day. I'd considered it a symbol for the embodiment of all that was wrong with my people. I saw it as a temptation to overcome. Evidently, it was much more. And my Shinri enemy from the swamps knew it. He knew pushing the shard's magic into me wasn't enough to reach the crown. He ignited my ad addiction, then sat and waited for me to cast on my own, using the only stone I had in my possession. I should have known. I should have at least considered the possibility of a link. I'd been a short-sighted fool, and now I was paying for it. The crown's magic was burrowing straight to the very heart of me. I could feel it, just like last time, heightening my aggression, toying with my anger, accentuating my hostility. Soon, nothing would be in me but the need to do violence and the desire to remind the world what I was capable of. Already, the thoughts were churning in me. The notion of what I could do with so much magic in my fingertips. I can white up the Aurelian and the Langorian, the entire tavern, the whole of Saren's kingdom. And all I had to do was let go. I can't. Not here. Not again. Grinding my teeth on a scream, I fought like hell. I pushed against the overwhelming power amassing inside me. It was like holding back a raging river with my hands. It was ferocious. Willful, it didn't want to go. It liked wherever it was. It wanted to make me great, to quench my thirst. If I would just give in, they had no idea how powerful I am. They trifle with me, taunt me. No one here cares if I live. Why should I spare them? I envisioned the city afterwards, how it would look. Brittle bodies strewn ash blown, blowing over the silent, empty streets. I imagined the stink of thousands of moldy corpses roasting in the late summer sun, and the idea excited me. It filled me with such a rush of eager satisfaction, such sick exhilaration, that those drinks I'd so hastily consumed nearly came back up, and I dug deeper. Repulsed by my own desires, I resisted with everything I had. I clung to the disgust to the fear that I wasn't strong enough, that I didn't want to be. I shoved, pushing at the excess magic, forcing it out, forcing myself to be stronger, until at last the crown's hold gave way, and its magic began to need to recede. As it left, awareness returned. I became conscious of myself again, and I realized I was on the floor, on my back, with Danyan's boot ramming into me. I had no idea how long I'd been indisposed, struggling against the crown, that every part of me hurt and his axe was raised high above my head for a killing blow. Your time is at an end, Shinri, he grinned. This is the age of Langor. His weapon came down. I rolled to the side of the edge, bit into the floor, less than an inch from my head. Seeing the throwing knife still in my grip, as Danyan ranked his axe free, I lifted up and thrust the slender blades into his gut. Howling, he lurched and brought his weapon to bear again. It came toward me. I twisted, grabbed the shaft with both hands, and jabbed the butt end back up into his face. From my position, the blow lacked force, yet it startled him. Enough that while he stumbled, I was able to twist away, snatch up a broken chair leg off the floor, lean up, and whack him across the jaw with it. Danyan collapsed. I felt like joining him, but a dozen men still blocked the front door. Lareth was advancing, and Danyan was already struggling to get up, shaking his dazed head and pulling out the knives like they were splinters. Lareth was closest. Feeling the spell I conjured with the obsidian still active inside me, I faced him. I held up my right hand and the air in front of it shifted. One last time I tried. Don't make me do this. Do what you must, Shinri, he said bravely. If I die, I die for her. I've been dying for Aelagar for over ten years. It isn't that great. Don't let me end your pain. Laerth drew his sword. He ran at me like a charging bull and I released the magic. Rippling out from the center of my palm, translucent waves pulsing back from the obsidian spread out between us. Laerth didn't even blink. He met them at full speed and was shot backwards. His feet left the floor. He hit the far wall, and I spun to find Danyan. I was poised to set the same surge of power in his direction, but the hulking Langorian wasn't attacking. He wasn't even standing. He was face down on the dirt floor, silent and unmoving. His giant axe was beside him, and the blade of a fancy Kalish lawn knife was buried in the center of his back. It was odd, but I couldn't spare the time to wonder on it. About to aim my magic at Danyan's men, I lifted my hands, and at that moment everything caught up to me. The beating, the drink, the energy I'd given to make the spell, I couldn't focus. Their faces blurred, the tavern revolved, 
It started spinning so rapidly around me that as a pair of men's polished black rail and riding boots moved to straddle Danyon's body, I thought I was hallucinating. The owner of the boots bent down to retrieve his knife from Danyon's back. Straightening, he stared at me. I got a good look at him, and then I was absolutely certain something vital had been knocked loose in my head.